Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings here at the U.S. Naval Institute. It is Wednesday, the 12th of June, 2024. Good to have you on board, everybody, for our 400th episode of the show. I'll pause here for a quick word from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Booz Allen. Accelerate today's missions with tomorrow's technologies. As the leader in providing AI solutions to the federal government, and one of the world's largest cybersecurity providers, Booz Allen advances game-changing capabilities rapidly, ethically, and securely. Learn more at boozallen.com defense. I'm here on the stage of the Jack C. Taylor Conference Center today, and my special guest is retired Marine Corps General Frank McKenzie. General McKenzie was the commander U.S. Central Command from, 19, from 2019 to 2022, and he's written a book just published by the Naval Institute Press. It is titled Melting Point, High Command and War in the 21st Century. General McKenzie, welcome to the show. It's great to be here today, Bill. So congrats on the book. Uh, for our audience, I gotta say, this book is not a typical retired officer memoir. So if you're listening to the show and you're thinking, oh, another four-star general has written his memoir, big deal, just stop right there. Um, this book is a must-read. It's a can't-put-it-down book. Uh, it's an insider's view of how national security decisions are made and how they are implemented. Uh, and General, I'm really happy to note that not only have you written this book, but that you also wrote for Proceedings and Naval History Magazine during your active duty career. I have, Bill. I, I've always felt that uh, the Proceedings is the premier professional journal really across the armed forces. I wrote for him back as a captain. My first article actually appeared when I was a first lieutenant, I believe. I wrote on coastal defense cruise missiles and uh, then continued writing for many years afterwards. It's a, it's a great magazine. I treasure my life membership in the, uh, in the Naval Institute and proud to be a part of your ongoing work. You've, you've been a member since 1977. Own and off since 77 and a life member since uh, 1990 when I won the Astor Prize. Nice, nice. Well, I gotta ask, um, since you started writing early in your career, was a book always something that you thought you would someday do? Didn't, no, it, not necessarily. I found I enjoyed the short form article, but I had the opportunity as a, uh, as a major and a lieutenant colonel to write a book on asymmetric warfare called Revenge of the Millions. And that sort of was my first book. It was a, really a long monograph published by uh, the, G, the government printing office. I was at the National Defense University. Okay. But I, I, then I learned I actually like to write longer stuff. And uh, I think, and I thought about writing a book for quite a while after that. It was on the front of my mind, and the opportunity came up, and I found actually writing's pretty easy for me. It's enjoyable, not a lot of work, so it, and it's a release as well. It allows you to get some things out of your system. The book is full of copious details of myriad meetings and decisions, uh, the conversations that you had with your subordinate commanders and also with the chairman and with the secretary, et cetera. Uh, do you keep a journal? So I did keep a, uh, a day book. And uh, unfortunately, the day I went off active duty, it uh, those became books classified. Were all, all, all those books were taken away from me. And, uh, and they are now in various archives. Uh, but with, I, with but the Ark of the Covenant and exactly, yeah, right. and you know, and many people can see them, but not me. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, but I did keep good notes, and uh, and then there's some unclassified stuff I kept as well. Okay. But I kept. You found you really did need to keep records of meetings because sometimes there's nobody else keeping a record from right. your side anyway. Uh, but it, but the, the other the other thing is it's hard to keep notes if you're talking. And I was actually talking in most of these meetings. And it's Got one it. thing to go into meetings as a note taker. It's another to go into meeting as a principal yeah. and, uh, and then sort of try to reconstruct what happened afterwards. And I was okay at that. I am not the world's best note taker. I go back through some of my journals sometimes. There's doodlings, uh -huh. football plays, uh, if I get bored. I mean, all kinds of stuff is in you know, my journals uh, in addition to the notes that I took. So I'm, I'm guessing reconstructing some of the, the meetings and stuff was probably took a while. It did, but, but, I, but I would also, some, you know, sometimes after a meeting was over, I'd go down and write it up. Got it. Not in the journal, just something, you know, just so I would have a memory for myself. Yeah. Because I was thinking about half, probably early on in the CENTCOM tour, I thought I might actually end up writing a book about it. Um, because of the uniqueness of the job. Uh, and in fact, the title, if I could take just a minute, let me just tell sure. you about yeah, the title. Do. So the title of the book is The Melting Point. 
And that's lifted from a wonderful book written by a woman named Barbara Tuchman about the First World War. And the title of her book is The Guns of August. She wrote it around 1960. And what it talks about is the way the nations of Europe slipped into the First World War in the spring, summer, and early fall of 1914. And it, it's a book that stood the test of time. I would commend it to anybody right now who wants to know and understand how nations go to war and how war plans affect the way nations go to war. Mm. But in her book, she uses a line, uh, that melting point of warfare, the temperament of the individual commander. And so I was that individual commander, and I was a combatant commander. And in the United States system of command, the combatant commander is in a position to give policy advice to national leadership and then ultimately to execute that policy advice. The chain of command for a, a, a combatant commander is very short. It's the President of the United States and the Secretary. Nobody else can give you orders. Uh, you know, in my case, the Commandant of the Marine Corps couldn't order me to do anything, the Chief of Naval Operations couldn't, and the Chairman couldn't. Because while the Chairman is the nation's senior military leader by custom, tradition, and law, and also the principal military advisor to the President and right. to the Secretary, he is not in the chain of command. He's an advisor. He's an advisor. So there are lots of people who give advice. There are lots of people who execute. Only one, only, only in the combatant commander do you give advice then execute. So now when you give advice, let's be clear and appropriately, you're the junior partner. So you know you have an opportunity. It's an unequal dialogue, as Elliot Cohen said, and he's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. But you have the opportunity to talk to decision makers, make your point. They're going to make a decision. But then you're the person who's got to walk out of the room and take that political decision, policy decision, turn it into actionable military plans and orders, and then cause the force to execute, and then be responsible for that execution. So therefore, it's a unique vantage point. And that struck me early on, and I had a chance to observe that earlier as the director of the Joint Staff, as a three-star, to observe combatant commanders and service chiefs in operation. And, and sort of see that and see the difference in those two jobs. And service chief is a very different job from combatant commander. But again, the combatant commander job is a unique place, and I felt it was worth talking about. So CENTCOM spans from Egypt in the west to Pakistan in the east with every hot spot in between, yeah. right? Uh, but the country that's most prominent in your book is Iran. Uh, and I'm curious, from the perspective of the CENTCOM commander, not just you, but also maybe your predecessors and your successor, is Iran the most important country in the region? It is the most, it's the most uh, threatening country in the region. It's the most irresponsible country in the region. And through its malign activities uh, by its Shia militant groups that it sponsors across the region and other entities, as well as its huge array of conventional weapons and the possibility of pursuing a nuclear weapon, it's uniquely dangerous. And it's inimical to our interests and the interests of many of our friends in the region. So yes, I would argue and that it is the most significant threat that we face. Additionally, the guidance I received from the various documents that telecommander would focus on that was clearly the main threat. So, yeah. and I had begun, I'd looked at Iran going back to 2010 when I was, uh, when I was uh, the, the planner really for General Mattis at Central Command when he was the commander, then back as the Marine Forces Central Command commander, then ultimately, of course, the, what we call the big J-5 upon the Joint Staff and the director. Right. Throughout all the sequence of assignments, I had the opportunity to continue to study Iran, continue to study the region. You study the rest of the globe as well, because as the director of the Joint Staff, you look at the whole world. Sure. But nonetheless, I had the opportunity to spend a lot of time thinking about Iran. Gotcha. Um, there are a lot of complex factors at work uh, in your book, um, from Washington politics, to regional alliances, to history, to culture, uh, and, and those things affect every decision that you write about in the book. Uh, one of the most important stories you tell is the U.S. airstrike on Iranian General Qasem Soleimani. That happened in early January 2020. Can you describe the presidential level decision, sure. the, the, the discussion and the decision, and then the implementation sure. of that, that sure. strike? So let's begin by just talking a little bit about Qasem Soleimani. Uh, the Islamic Republican Guard Corps is an elite unit within the Iranian uh, government. It's not actually directly part of the military, it's sort of separate. Right. And inside it is an even more elite unit called the Quds Force, Q-O-D-S, Quds Force. And Soleimani commanded the Quds Force. He came- For a long time. For a long time, for a long time. And he, he so as a result, you had a lot of policy continuity. And for d several decades, he was really the voice of Iran across the region. He could 
He could go into Iraq and knock Shia militant heads together and get them to do the same thing. During, our, during the late stages of our war in Iraq, he is personally responsible for the deaths of many hundreds of American soldiers and Marines. He introduced the explosively formed penetrator, which is a particularly lethal IED against our improved MRAPs and our upgun vehicles. And a lot of people died as a result of Soleimani's action. And not only U.S. And, 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 and coalition forces there, but across the region as well. So he was a unique individual. And people say, well, he was so unique, would you call him Rommel? No, I would, I would, if I were to compare him to a Nazi figure, I'd compare him to Reinhard Heydrich, actually, mm -hmm. uh, who, who was also very effective in his own way. But he was unique. And so in the spring of 2019, when I took command of Central Command, let's just back up and revisit what was going on then. Sure. The, the Trump administration was carrying out the maximum pressure campaign against Iran to force them back to nuclear negotiations. There was no military component to the maximum pressure campaign. It was all economic and diplomatic. But Iran, we believe, we know actually, in the spring of 2019, they observed how forces had been drawn down in the Central Command region. Didn't have a carrier there, didn't have a Marine ready, uh, amphibious ready group there. Fighter squadrons had gone down. A number of other things had happened that seemed to show that, that, that we were less interested in the region and would be less committed to the region. So, so max, maximum pressure, yeah. just I want to sure. foot stomp that for a second. Maximum pressure, economic and political pressure, right. but the military pressure, we took our foot off the gas. Right. There was no, there was no military, com designed military component to that. What, what I propose, though, was that if we're going to support the maximum pressure campaign, the military support to that should be we want to deter Iran from acting militarily to try to find a way out. Sure. So if there was going to be a, a component to it and it wasn't top down, it was rather us suggesting it, we should, we should actually provide that military deterrence. So as Iranian decision makers made decisions about how to react to the, to the uh, maximum pressure campaign, they wouldn't choose a military option. And so if you're going to achieve deterrence, though, you have to demonstrate capability and will because your target is the cognitive space of the opponent, his or her mind as they sit there. And so as they look at us, they know our capabilities. They, all, they know, very well know what U.S. capabilities are. Even if they're not in the theater, they know we can bring them in. But what they doubt is what they, the Iranians have always doubted is our will whether or not we would be willing to use those capabilities. And so, therefore, in the spring of 2019, they didn't doubt our eventual capabilities. They doubted our will to respond. So come in May of 2019, a number of plots were afoot to attack U.S. bases in the region as well as our allies. And so we were able to react pretty quickly as we gained knowledge of this. We brought more forces in, brought a carrier in, brought some Marines in, brought some fighter squadrons and other things in. And that did have a deterring effect on Iran in that they chose not to attack our bases in the region. What they did do, though, was attack shipping. They attacked shipping in, uh, off, off UAE, the United Arab Emirates, and Strait of Hormuz, and other places with reasonable effect. So, and this was hard to tie back to Iran, but not impossible. Through their proxies. Through their proxies yeah. and through the several levels of cutout. So this occurred in the summer of 2019. At the same time, in the summer of 2019, they shot down an RQ-4 drone. Navy operated high altitude jet powered drone flying at 40,000 feet well on our side of the Strait of Hormuz. Now, in retrospect, we know that was a low-level decision made by a, an Ar Iranian commander, an, okay. an IRGC aviation commander. That decision wasn't made in Tehran. We know that now. Didn't know it then. Got we know it. it now. And that's not unusual for sure. Iran. Yeah. Low-level commanders are prone to make aggressive tactical decisions. But they shot the drone down, and we had an opportunity to respond then. And so we offered a menu of choices up. I did, through the secretary to the president. Uh, mainly striking a series of sites along the Iranian southern coast, but it would have been strikes in Iran. Outside the Strait of Hormuz? Yeah, in the north of the Strait, of, in, in the general proximity of the Strait of Hormuz, Got it. In, the, in the Arabian Gulf would be a good way to say it. Got it. Uh, so uh, package, target package went up. I was confident there would be no or very low loss of life. I had very good intelligence on this. As we know, uh, what happened, it got into the White House, and the president got bad advice from advisors over there who said, well, it's going to kill 150 people. There's no evidence of that. Uh, yeah. I was pretty confident we were going to strike that, it in the middle of the night. That's in your book. The right. Iranians knew we were coming. 
Nobody wants to die with a JDAM on their forehead, which they knew was probably coming in, so they were happy to get away from those sites. So I was confident we could do it with a low level of collateral. Unfortunately, it was presented to the president as 150 people. Well, if that's the information he got, he made a right decision. It wasn't worth killing 150 people as a result of shooting down a drone. An, un an unmanned? That's aircraft. right. So sure. I don't fault the president for that decision. Right. I fault the security apparatus that presented him with that decision. And that's not in the Department of Defense. That's on the, what we'd say on the other side of the river where that okay. happened. So NSC staff. The bottom line is we didn't act. The Iranians drew a lesson from that. Yep. In September, they struck into uh, Saudi Arabia, struck the Saudi oil fields, the uh, Aramco oil fields in northeastern Saudi Arabia with very good effect. We didn't, and because of the way they routed their, their in this case, drones, largely drones and yep. cruise missiles, um, surprised the Saudis, had good effect on the target. So also, what also had a big impact on the global price of oil. It certainly did for a short, for a fairly long period of time, actually. Yep. So the picture I'm painting is in the second half of 2019, these attacks are ramping up. And they're ramping up because I would argue we had an opportunity to stop it early. We chose not to do it. Not to do it. So the attacks ramp up. At the same time, attacks are picking up on our forces in Iraq and Syria, culminating in December with a lethal attack that, that killed a U.S. contractor in the second half of December. Attacks are also ramping up on our embassy. Uh, evidence that they want to attack the embassy in Baghdad. The government of Iraq is not able to fully defend it properly. In this period of time, uh, Kasim Soleimani is going to fly into Iraq, and we believe, and with good reason, and based on good intelligence, he's going to coordinate attacks against Americans. And uh, if, if he goes in and he's allowed to act, we're going to lives are going to be lost. Maybe it, he's not going to run up to the embassy wall with a satchel charge, put it on there himself, but he's going to talk to the people that are going to do that. Yeah. And so as a result of this, ultimately the president made a decision to strike him. And uh, I had an opportunity to give advice on that. My advice was to do the strike. I felt the risks of inaction were greater than the risks of action. I knew and understood the Iranians would respond, but I felt that that would be a manageable response. And so uh, on, uh, early, in early January 2020, he flew from Tehran. We thought he was going to go to Baghdad. He flew on to Damascus, spent a day or two in Damascus, then flew back to Baghdad, landed in Baghdad around little after midnight Baghdad time, late afternoon Tampa time. Yep. And, uh, and so we're, we're watching him. We had, we had the, the authority to strike, strike him. And so we struck him. And we struck him on what we call Route Irish, a name that doesn't mean a lot to, unless you've been in, uh, in Baghdad and in Iraq. Route Irish was just one of the route names for roads you drive on. Uh, Soleimani had killed a lot of Americans on Route Irish. Mm. So the fact that he met his end on Route Irish was, I think, a little bit of karma. And, uh, but we struck him. And it was a very, you know, in these types of operations, it's very calm. Uh, there's not a lot of shouting. There's not a lot of excitement. You're yep. just doing a job. The job's done. And as a commander that I immediately turned to the consequences of that action, you've got to talk to your friends in the region and let them know what happened. And you've got to prepare for the Iranian response, which occurred about a week later when they struck Al-Assad Air Base, uh, where we had a lot of forces, a lot of airplanes. But we were able to anticipate that attack and position our forces. So after the Iranians took their last look, we moved, they struck, and nobody died. Now, 80 or 90 people, maybe a little more than that, received traumatic brain injury as a result of being bombarded for the first time in history, ballistic missiles. The percussion. The, they, the, yeah. And so we're used to much smaller rounds, 120 millimeter mortars, katushas of much smaller warhead size. These were large warheads. So people were injured, took a couple of days for that to become evident in the testing. Yep. But the most important thing was nobody died. And so as a result of that, and the Iranians messaged us and said, look, we're ready to call this off. We're, we're, we're ready to stop now. We've, we've taken our revenge. And I think the president made a very wise decision. He, he walked away from it. And that was the right thing to do. Now, if they had killed Americans, I don't know what would have happened. It yeah. could have been a very different morning in Iran that day. Uh, but but we, I would argue we actually saved the Iranians from themselves again by repositioning, so their missiles were very accurate. This was not a signal. They weren't trying to, some, some discussion's been had that, well, they weren't trying to kill Americans. They were trying to kill Americans. We just prevented them from killing Americans. And so that was sort of the, the Qasem Soleimani story. Uh, we know afterwards it had a profound effect on Iran. The, uh, the Iranian foreign minister, foreign minister Zarif, made the mistake of recording an oral history a little bit later. Mm. And of course, he's in Iran, so somebody leaked it. And the New York Times published it. And there's a good article in the New York Times that's worth reading, where Zarif said the death of Soleimani was a major blow. It was like losing a major city in Iran. Wow. And so 
I go back to the discussion about capability and will. So they had seen U.S. will in action in a way they had not anticipated. No way did the, did the Iranians think that was what was going to happen to Qasem Soleimani when he went in, as he had many times before, into Baghdad. Look, there were all other, there were many other effects across the region, not all positive. But the major enduring effect is he's out of the game. So he was the person that spoke last in meetings. He had a direct familial relationship with the Supreme Leader, and he's gone. His successor has none of those characteristics. He does have a relationship because the Quds Force Commander can talk to the Supreme Leader, but he doesn't have that familial relationship. A strong battlefield leader is gone, and, and he's not coming back. Fascinating. <clears throat> um, perhaps the most difficult situation you faced in your tenure at CENTCOM was the total withdrawal of U.S. forces from Afghanistan in, in August 2021. Well, it actually happened over you know, months, right? But, but culminating in uh, August 2021. That decision and its implementation spanned across two presidential administrations. Uh, how could it have gone better? So I would argue, uh, Bill, that the, the reason what left got us out of Afghanistan was, as you noted, two presidents, as unlike as any two presidents in American history, had one area of policy continuity. They wanted to depart Afghanistan regardless of the consequences. And so that began under President Trump with the Doha Agreement, which was signed in February of 2020, and committed us to do certain things on a timeline to leave Afghanistan. And it committed the Taliban to do certain things. We did the, th we did the things that we were supposed to do. Yeah. The Taliban did none of the things they were supposed to do, with one exception. They stopped attacking us, and they doubled down on the government of Afghanistan. So we're on a timeline to leave. And so the latter stages of the Trump administration, we, we, we drew down methodically until uh, election, until inauguration day, January 2021. Our force presence was about 2,500 U.S. troops on the ground, and we had committed to going to zero uh, in May. And we could have done that if directed. We had a path to do that. It, it would have had per bad effect, and we can talk about that in a moment. But we were prepared to do that. But really, the decision then defaulted to, you know, to President Biden. New president. And I, and I would argue that the Biden administration maintained policy continuity with the Trump administration. And the president thought about it. I had the opportunity to give advice to the president on multiple occasions. And I appreciated the opportunity to give that advice. And he chose to, to, to go to zero. And that decision came out in mid-April of 2021. And originally we were going to go to zero by 11 September, then we changed it to the end of August, 31 August. We were going to reach zero U.S. US forces. And what was the reason for changing it by weeks? Or I, I cannot tell you that. Okay. I don't know. I think in retrospect they thought 11 September, while it might have looked initially as a as a good date, had a lot of haunting connotations for sure. many people. And so they moved it to 31 August. So. My, my, my principal concern that I draw out in the book with the decision was, it's one thing to make a decision, we're going we're to pull everything out. We're going to pull all our military forces out. But at the same time, we should have also made a parallel decision to bring our embassy out, to bring our American citizens out, yep. and to bring the at-risk Afghans out. And by at-risk Afghans, I mean the many tens of thousands of Afghans who had fought alongside us, who had supported us, who had been our translators, our, all kinds of people that have worked closely with us. But the vision was that we would be able to withdraw our military, which was generally completed in a very smooth operation by around the 12th of July. Hmm. Scott Miller, our commander in Afghanistan, left on 12 July. I relieved him as the commander, Commander CENTCOM and Commander U.S. Forces Afghanistan, and I put a two-star admiral in there, a guy named Pete Vaisley, a wonderful SEAL admiral, and he was my guy on the ground in Afghanistan from 12 July on. But on 12 July, as that relief happened, we had would, would effectively withdrawn all of our support, in-country support for the government of Afghanistan. The air support that we, had given them, that we had given them was largely gone. Our ability to help them with their logistics was gone. And so they're on their own. The provincial capitals began falling. We see an acceleration of the decline of the government of Afghanistan. And I should point out parenthetically that they were out of the Doha uh, agreement. The government of Afghanistan was not a negotiating partner for that. Many people don't realize that. that that's an amazing the thing in, this, in the book. Right, and it the, deflate, I think it morally deflated the government of Afghanistan. It, it, it would and, only have right. to, right? And look, I, I don't want to say the government of Afghanistan was perfect because it's not. They sure. could not get their act together well enough to negotiate 
with the Taliban as they should have, but the Taliban, I would argue, never had an intent to negotiate. It was right. all, all designed to support the military campaign to take over the country. Right. So the, Af the Afghan government's not part of the Doha agreement, not part of the negotiations. That's right. And they know that politically, within the United States, a decision has been made that we're going to leave. We're going to leave, and we're going to leave on a schedule. Yeah. And, uh, and so that, that's very deflating. So we get into the, you know, in, well into July. We've still got a huge embassy platform. We've still got none of our citizens have been required to leave. And we've only begun to bring out uh, a handful under the special immigrant visa program, a handful of the at-risk Afghans. So, you know, you know, I would argue, depending on your perspective, it's either American arrogance or American exceptionalism mm. to believe that you can actually walk away from a war except defeat and still dictate what's going on. Yeah. And, I and I would say, in fact, the, the laws of history operate even against the United States much as we might not want to believe that at, at different times. So uh, we get into August, situation's very, very grim, but we don't, de we don't declare a non-combatant evacuation operation until the 14th of August. So that's, wow. that's, they're in Kabul then. So it's all over, uh, the government ceases to exist, we're gonna get our people out, it's a large, complex, extraordinary operation. We have to put combat forces back in uh, to secure uh, the air, airfield, because we could secure it with the 700 forces that we were that we had left if the Afghan army stayed whole. But the Afghan army melted away yeah. that second week of August. So it was just us. So we had to bring in significant more combat power to secure the airfield. Uh, and and but we move over. We finally get the embassy over to the airfield, 14, 15 August. So now we're all at the we're all at the airfield. And now we got to bring people out, and we bring out. All told, about 124,000 people. It's a remarkable effort. Uh, we don't get out all the people that we want, uh, particularly the at-risk Afghans, yeah. because the system was just the system was overwhelmed by it. Our ability to process uh, people trying to come in, trying to come into the airfield, was overwhelmed by the, the, the many hundreds of thousands of people that wanted to come on. We could have brought out another 300,000 had wow. we stayed. Uh, but had we stayed beyond 31 August, we would have been fighting the Taliban because the deal was 31 August. And so I will, I will tell you, and it's pretty clear in the book, the Taliban wanted us to leave, and they wanted to facilitate us leaving. So the Taliban had no interest in attacking us, even in late August during, in the, during these periods of, of grave danger. Who did want to attack us and who did attack us and who was frequently prevented from attacking us was ISIS. ISIS, ISIS Khorasan, Khorasan. Yep. and tragically they were able to have one successful attack. We prevented many other attacks, and the loss of those 13 brave Americans is certainly something I'm going to carry with me for the rest of my life. 11 Marines, a soldier, and a sailor, and that was a terrible day at Abbey Gate. We also brought out 13,000 Afghans that day. Hmm. Uh, so I don't think their lives were lost in vain, uh, but it's hard to it's hard to have a discussion about that. I'm sure. Um, a, a major theme in the book is the importance of civilian control of the U.S. military. And you articulate a very nuanced view of why senior military leaders should never consider resigning over differences in policy. Uh, illegal orders, that's, right. you say, that's right. no, if you get an illegal order, you obviously can't right. follow that. Right. But if it's a difference in policy, you, uh, senior military leaders can't resign over that. Uh, the public often hears this general or that admiral should have thrown their stars on the table right. and, and resigned over this or that, right? Why do you think that's wrong? The way that the Republic runs is uh, you have constitutionally uh, appointed, constitutionally elected civilian leadership. They're charged with making decisions for what the nation's gonna do or not do. And they bear all responsibility for that. Now, the US military is a subordinate element of that. We carry out the taskings that we get from that constitutionally appointed, constitutionally elected authority. And appropriately and properly, you got to do what, the, what your civilian leadership wants you to do. You may disagree with the order. You may find the order immoral. You may find the order religiously distasteful. You may find a lot of things. But if the order is not illegal, uniform, first of all, the Uniform Code of Military Justice requires you to execute the order but also custom and tradition of the U.S. military as you execute it. And so when I was at CENTCOM, I had 14 lawyers who were happy to tell me if the order was illegal. <laughs> uh, and I didn't need them to tell me that because I, I know what an illegal order is. I've never actually received one in 42 years, 10 months of service. Uh, but I knew what an illegal order was. And even in, in, under our system, a civilian leader has the right to make a wrong decision 
and a right and an expectation that that wrong decision is going to be faithfully executed by the U.S. military. Any other thing, and particularly when a four-star general stands up and, or admiral stands up and says, I'm not going to do it, that is a political act. At the level of a combatant commander or a four-star leader is, you, an action like that is going to have political consequences. We never want the U.S. military to be in a situation where we're making those kinds of decisions. And so there's actually quite a bit of history on this, and I'll just cite, I'll cite a couple of examples. One is in 1942, uh, you know, Pearl Harbor occurred in December 1941. We're beginning to go to war in the Pacific then, and we're building up forces in Europe now for some future campaign against Germany. Sure. And the, General Marshall, effectively the chairman, let's just call him the chairman then, he wasn't, but for right. our purposes, the, the argument will do, uh, wanted, he favored a plan called Bolero, which was we were going to build up combat power in England for a cross-channel attack into France and into the mainland. That was United States strategic thinking. You go for the heart of the enemy, uh, direct approach, the tradition of Sam Grant, U.S. strategic thinking. Churchill favored Churchill, the English prime minister, for a number of reasons, not all we would agree with, favored a, 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 a Mediterranean approach. Going to North Africa, avoid the direct assault, because the British had been bled out in the First World War. We were not, yep. and they, had, they knew what it was like to fight the German army in France, and that, that's a hard experience. So he yep. argued against it. And subordinates at the staff level, so Marshall and, uh, and, and, and the British planners argued about it. But ultimately, Roosevelt said, we're going to land in North Africa, and directed Marshall to do that. Now, Marshall disagreed very strongly with that. And, but at the, when it's all said and done, He's the president. He gets to make the call. Now, looking back at it over half a century later, more than that, really, it looks like Roosevelt might have made the right decision because we, the, the U.S. Army went into North Africa, learned how to fight, and got bloodied, but learned how to fight and was a different, better army when it went to Sicily, when it went to Italy, and then ultimately in the spring, summer of 1944 when it confronted the Germans in Operation Overlord and what followed. So that's an example, really. And Roosevelt overrode military advice many other times in the Second World War. And many people don't realize that. And Roosevelt had no military training particularly. He had been the undersecretary of the Navy. Yep. Uh, but he was actually a pretty acute strategist. The other example would be, uh, and I mentioned it in the book as well, I, I, General Mattis left a copy of uh, a biography of Harold K. Johnson, uh, who was the chief of staff of the U.S. Army during Vietnam. And in it, uh, Harold, Harold K. Johnson was an American hero. He was on the Bataan Death March. Mm. Came up, through the, came up through the officer ranks and became the chief of staff. During the height of the Vietnam War, he and the other chiefs talked about resigning. And actually, going over to the White House, he undid the clutch backings on his stars. And they got in there and ultimately did not choose to resign. And I think that was the right decision, uh, even though President Johnson was making demonstrably wrong decisions. Now, when later life, in the book, Honorable Warrior, I believe is the title of the book by Sorley. It's a great book. He, he, later in life, Harold K. Johnson came to regret that decision. Mm. I disagree with that. I think he made the right decision the first time. You're in the fight. The people you're sending to Vietnam, we, they can't resign. Just like when I was making, thinking about my, not, not having my advice taken in Afghanistan, the Marine soldiers, sailors, airmen were sending into Afghanistan. We don't ask them if they get on the 17. You want to go or not? You want right. to go or not? No, you got to go. And so for a senior leader to quit over that is, I think, an act of moral cowardice. And so it was very clear to me about that. And it's very clear in the arc of the republic that it is unequal. Civilian leadership needs to be, uh, needs to be supreme here. The military gets an opportunity to give input. But policy must guide, and the military has to adopt that policy, sometimes distasteful as it is, because the principle of civilian control is more important than any single decision because there are always going to be more decisions. And I just, you know, I, I had the opportunity to see it practiced up close. And I was often not happy with, with, with the situation I was in, but I think the larger, the larger purpose there remains. You also point out uh, that uh, politics and policy mix. Right. And, and oftentimes, you know, folks who are maybe, I know, I know Lieutenant Hamlet was guilty of this, of watching political decisions about the military or that right. impacted the military, thinking, well, that's just politics. Right. And you point out, and you quote Churchill, and I, I, can't, right. I, right. I can't even paraphrase it, right. but that at the pinnacle, and this comes out in your book, right. 
uh, in multiple different decisions. Right. It, at the pinnacle, at the presidential level, at right. the White House level, they're inseparable. So yes. it's naive to think that politics and policy can be separated or that a president's not going to make decisions that impact the military right. that, are Im that, that impinge on you know, domestic politics. Bill, you're exactly right. So I'll go back to the Marshall uh, Roosevelt discussion over, uh, over the torch landings in, in fall of 1942. When Roosevelt finally wrote a note, an, an abrupt little directive note to George Marshall to do the operation, he said, and I want the landings to occur before 7 November. Why was 7 November important? It's midterm elections in the United States. Mm. So now it turns out. There you go. Turns out the Navy couldn't deliver the force by 7 November. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they actually landed a little bit later. Than that. But here's the thing. So Roosevelt asked for that. When it didn't happen, he didn't push back. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But, but he wanted, but, he, but he, it, there were, even with Roosevelt, there were political calculations there. Yeah. I think you can look at some of Abraham Lincoln's decisions in the, in the Civil War trying to win an election in 1864, uh, where he had, where he, he, that was also a factor as well. Yeah. You're, you're, They're just inseparable and to okay. believe they're not, I think is, is, as you said, and I said in the book, naive. Right. Uh, you also brought up a, a bit of recent history that was good for me to, to recall, which was when CENTCOM was established, right? Because right? I think you were the 13th commander, 17th, 14th, 14th, 14th commander 14th. of CENTCOM. So not that long ago, right? right? We've, had, we've had U.S. Pacific Command, now Indo-PACOM, for a much longer period. Um, and that was another decision that you point to. The military didn't want, really want to have a CENTCOM. That's right. Um, but but the, at the White House, they were like convinced that we really need a, a four-star level commander, a theater combatant commander, to deal with this part of the world. And the Navy sort of slow rolled it. The Navy of all the services slow rolled it because narrow waters, yep. not a great place to operate a ship. I mean, up in the Arabian Gulf, you, you've been up there. It's not a great place for an aircraft carrier. Right. The Red Sea, where we've got a carrier right now, also not a great place for an aircraft carrier to be. So the Navy viscerally opposed it. And this goes back to a, a long time. Yep. So much prefer the broad open expanses of the Pacific if you can, you know, it, much better place to operate. However, um, I think civilian leadership in this case had the right, had the right idea. I mean, there, I use the, the line in the book, you know, about the British Army. They always fight their battles where four map sheets come together, yeah. uphill and in the rain. And, uh, <laughs> and so what you had was a uniquely difficult place to coordinate between European Command and yep. uh, Pacific Command. And so you carve out this new space, and it took a long while for that to take off. And in fact, I would argue even to this day, there's a there are artifacts of artifacts of opposition that exist to it. Gotcha. Um, the strategic backdrop uh, for your time at CENTCOM included the 2018 National Defense Strategy, which increased the emphasis on China and the Indo-Pacific, right. and it de-emphasized or tried to de-emphasize right. the Middle East. I think we had a um, uh, proceedings author recently. Uh, paraphrase a, a quote, you know, the, the, you may not be interested in the Middle East, but the Middle East is certainly interested in you. Uh, so several places in the book, you suggest that that was short-sighted thinking or, or perhaps not holistic thinking. Right. So I'm trying to get you to, I'm drawing sure. you out here with, with sure. your thinking about China, China's sure. role in the Middle East, right. And, right. and how to see it more holistically. Right. So first of all, I agree, China is the principal pacing threat that we face, and we have to recognize that. Long term, we need to, we need to be prepared to fight and win against China if we're tasked to do that. So yep. no argument for me on that at all. But I would argue that the United States is not just a Western Pacific power, we're a global power. Right. And if you're a global power, you have to think globally. And so you might not necessarily want to only contest China in the Western Pacific. China gets over half of its hydrocarbons through the Strait of Hormuz. If you're going to fight China, might it not be better to consider alternatives that would limit them coming through the Strait of Hormuz rather than the Strait of Malacca, where they're probably going to be able to generate more combat power? Sure. So we, 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 we stovepipe ourselves sometimes. And I think the NDS uh, was probably had, had maladroit messaging in the Middle East. We scared our friends there. And so there was no need to do that. Look, indo pacom has got most of the combat power of the U.S. military today. Yep. Uh, and it doesn't take a lot of combat power in CENTCOM to even up against uh, Iran. 
So I felt that we were uh, not smooth with our messaging, not smooth with our design for the way we're going to do this, because clearly you're not going to take all your forces out of the Middle East. You're not going to be able to do that. Even more so the case today, now that Israel has come into the region, which is a major substantial change since the NDS was written. So uh, I don't disagree with the fact that China should be the pacing threat. I disagree with the way that we messaged that the focus on China. Because, you know, Russia didn't get the message either. They still believe they're relevant, too. Yeah. And they're actually acting out a little bit. So as a global power, you have to take a global view. You can't afford the luxury of focusing on a single area. And I think sometimes the literal, the literal didactic interpretation of the NDS inside the department led us to do that in a way that damaged our ability to maximize the effects of friendships in the region with our, with our erstwhile partners. The word nuance uh, jumped out at, at me from your book in a couple different places, yeah. and uh, I think that that's that's key, right? It's right. It, was a, it was a lack of nuance. It was a lack of nuanced. Yeah. We needed we needed to be we needed to be much more nuanced in the way we message it. Uh, we needed to spend a lot more time talking to our friends in the region, uh, and then we needed to look at artful ways to do forced deployments to continue to show our concern with what's going on in the region. Because you're right, as, as you noted earlier, you might be finished with these guys, but they're not necessarily finished with you. Yeah. And, and as we see today, yeah. uh, the region's a tinderbox. You know, effectively, the uh, Bab el Mendeb is now closed to transit. So the Suez Canal is now closed to, to transit. That's a significant policy problem for the United States that extends globally, actually, not just a Middle East problem. It affects a lot of other different issues, for core issues for the United States is national security. Yeah, that's a Mahanian problem. It yeah, very much so. Uh, so I'm glad, let's segue to that, because uh, last question we have time for, and then we'll, we'll get to some audience questions after we wrap the show up. Um, but what's happening in the Middle East right now? Your book, The Information Cutoff Day, the ICOD Day, I would, you know, for active right. duty folks will right. recognize that, that term. The ICOD of your book, uh, what pre preceded right. September um, I mean, seventh of October right. last year, the Hamas attack on on Israel, and then everything that is, has been unleashed since then. Um, so I, my question is: uh, Is there any possibility, in your view, for peace in the Israel Gaza Israel Hamas uh, situation? And then I also want to get you to talk a little bit about the Red Sea because you talked about sure. that at lunchtime and, sure. and w what's happening right now with the Houthis and yeah. the, the shutdown of the Bab el Mandeb, et cetera. It, it's, it's a tinderbox right now. Yeah. And we're, we're there, and I don't see an exit strategy. I don't see how, right. how this ends for the right. United States or, or ends in peace for the region. Right. So let me start with a, with a broad take on what's going on in Gaza and, and across the region. Sure. What's interesting with the... Uh, with, with, with the Hamas attack on Israel and the Israeli response is what did not happen. And what did not happen was Lebanese Hezbollah did not enter in, into the fight. Northern Israel, in right. strength up, up north. Yep. A guy named Nasrullah who r runs Lebanese Hezbollah, the largest non-state military entity in the world with tens of thousands of missiles that can fire into Israel. He chose not to enter. Now, they're low-level back and forth. The Israelis are striking the Lebanon. He's striking south. Right. But believe me, if he came in, you'd know. It would be dramatic. So that has not happened. Iran has not come into the fight either. Yep. Um, now, and, and I, when I, you say, well, they attacked Israel, that had nothing to do with Gaza. Uh, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. But okay. Iran has not chosen to come in and support, and support uh, what's going on with, with, with Hamas. The Houthis have, but they are very radical, true believers, uh, supported by Iran, not directly controlled by Iran. But down in Yemen, uh, you know, they, they can't hit Israel very effectively because they just don't have the weapons that will range there. But what they can do is close off the Bab el-Mendeb. And so they've done that. And we've made a policy declaration that it's vital to our national security interest to open it, and we have not done so. And I, every day that it, every day that it uh, remains closed, and it is closed today as we speak, I think erodes U.S. credibility mm -hmm. on a global scale. And people who have interest in other straits, such as the Taiwan Strait, will look at that and draw their own conclusions. So I think it's an important thing that we certainly do need need to get resolved here as as we go forward. And we have. A lot of combat power in the region right now. We have an aircraft carrier that's steaming in the Red Sea. We got Burke class destroyers down around the Bab el Mandeb. We have other kinds of air air power and firepower that we could devote to this task. Should we choose to do so, we just need to make a policy decision to do that. The Houthis can be compelled. They are compellable. We can apply adequate firepower to them to make them stop, or if we can't make them stop, to remove the tools they use to close the strait. 
Those are within, those capabilities exist. We just have to make a decision to use those capabilities. And the final point I'd make on that is, I believe the risk of escalation is minor should that happen. I do not believe that Iran would come in on a large scale should that happen. I just might, that's just my theory of the, of the case down there from a lot, a lot of long-term observation of it. So one other point I'd like to, I, I said Iran, Iran's attack on Israel in April was not related to Gaza, and it's not. What it was related to was the fact that over the last two or three years or more than that, Israel has significantly outfought Iran around the region in a proxy war that's fought in the shadows uh, between their security services and, their, and, and other elements of their nations, and culminating in the one April strike against uh, IRGC planners in Damascus, killed six or seven uh, people there. Iran felt it had to reestablish reestablished deterrence, if you will, with Israel as a result of that, had nothing to do with Gaza. So yeah. they attacked Israel with 300 plus weapons. Um, and uh, over the last 15 years, Iran's missiles, drones, and cruise missiles have expanded exponentially and become very effective. So they had pretty good confidence they would have success. It was not a signaling attack. It was an attack designed to, to destroy Nevatim airfield and the Negev, um, and they failed. Mm. And why did they fail? First of all, Israeli defenses are very good. David's sling, uh, Iron Dome, Iron Beam, Patriot, all worked very effectively. We helped, but who also helped were the Arab neighbors. And that's an important thing because I've just closed my final observation about the region is everyone in the region understands the threat of Iran. And they understand that threat is primarily a fires threat. It's a ballistic missile, drone, land attack cruise missile threat. Therefore, to defend against it, you need naval power, you need air power, and you need ground power in terms of Patriot systems. And, and, and air situation and, and, awareness, right? And all that goes with that. The secret sauce is the common operational picture, yep. the COP, and that's maintained, the U.S. maintains that through our Air Operations Center at al Yadid Air Base in Qatar. And nations in the region are willing to share that more readily than anything else because they're not giving up sovereignty when they do that. Nobody wants other forces based in their country and they don't necessarily want to base in someone else's country. But if you can share information, then you can build a common operational picture. You can say, hey, here's what the Iranians are doing. We see them, here, here they come. And so then you can work together. And this began in 2021, 20, uh, in the fall of 2021, I began to hold a series of meetings at Sharm El Sheikh, the southern end of the Sinai Peninsula, with chiefs of defense across the region, including the Israeli chief of defense. Mm. So you got the Saudi Chad, you got the Israeli Chad, other Chads all sitting down, and we're talking about that which concerns us the most, and that which concerned us the most was the Iranian missile threat. And they're keenly aware of it. Ten years earlier, we had tried to push this on our uh, Gulf partner countries. They were, they didn't, they were not, they wouldn't bite. They bite now because the imminence of the threat and what Iran has done, their own activities and the growing clear and obvious Iranian threat. So there's a lot of momentum behind improving air and missile defense architecture across the region. That's why I believe whatever happens in Gaza, the path of Israeli Saudi normalization is going to continue. And we have an opportunity to make this happen. There are a lot of, con a lot of contingencies there. Yep. Not, it's not a given. But I think the Arab neighbors know and understand what Israel brings to the fight. They know and understand the imminence of the threat from Iran. And they, they all recognize the greatest threat is Iran. And that's what motivates them more than anything else. So I think the, the, the future, I don't want to say bright because I hesitate ever to say the future is bright in the Middle East. But the opportunities are there to go forward. And so I think we're at a, we're at a hinge moment now where that might be possible. There is a bit of a silver lining there. There is. That's good to hear. Well, sir, we're unfortunately out of time. My guest today has been General Frank McKenzie, U.S. Marine Corps, retired. His book, Melting Point, High Command and War in the 21st Century, needs to be on everyone's summer reading list. General, thanks for being here today and for sharing your insights. This was great. Bill, it's always great to come back here to the Naval Academy and the U.S. Naval Institute, and thanks for having me. Well, that wraps up our 400th episode of the Proceedings Pot Podcast brought to you by Booz Allen. This episode is brought to you by Booz Allen. Accelerate today's missions with tomorrow's technologies. As the leader in providing AI solutions to the federal government and one of the world's largest cybersecurity providers, Booz Allen advances game-changing capabilities rapidly, ethically, and securely. Learn more at boozallen.com defense. Until next week, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.